So, here we go. So again, welcome. And we, I'd just like to welcome you as, uh, I'm the education manager with the Columbia Land Conservancy. I'm Heidi Bach. And for those of you who are coming to us from all over the country, uh, the Columbia Land Conservancy is a nonprofit uh, land trust with headquarters in Chatham, New York. And our mission is working with the community to conserve the farmland, forests, wildlife habitat, and rural character of Columbia County while strengthening connections with pe between people and the land. And one of the ways that we do that is through programs like this. And Nature Night was started back in 2019 as a way to connect with people in the colder months in our office. And, uh, you know, through the uh, sort of the silver lining of the pandemic, we've been able to do these via Zoom and, uh, you know, are able to connect with a lot more people than we would. Our office would not fit 50 people. So we're excited uh, and we're excited to have Jean here. And before we get started with our formal program, I would like to uh, read a land acknowledgement provided by the Stockbridge Muncie Cultural Affairs Department. It is with gratitude and humility that we acknowledge that we are learning, speaking, and gathering on the ancestral homelands of the Mohican people who are the indigenous people of this land in Columbia County that we now call Columbia County. And despite tremendous hardship in being forced from here, today their community resides in Wisconsin and is known as the Stockbridge Muncie community. We pay honor and respect to their ancestors past and present as we commit to building a more inclusive and equitable space for all. So I thank you for listening to the land acknowledgement. And now I would like to introduce Jean McKay, who is a local artist, educator, and writer, and naturalist. And she grew up in Troy and now lives in Skodak Landing, New York. And her new book, The Nature Explorer's Sketchbook, inspires exploration, creative expression, and observation. It's a beautiful sketchbook and it has ideas, tips, and plenty of space for drawing. And so what we're gonna do tonight is Jean is gonna show us some of her techniques. We're gonna have a little chat. And if you haven't already grabbed your paper and pencil, get that now. So Jean, if I may ask, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Have you always been a nature explorer? Um, yeah, hi. And um, I don't know whether you want to do a spotlight thing or whether, sure. I don't know what, how, how that works exactly, but. I don't know, I have you on speaker view, but you're right, let's see. Uh, that okay. might not be the same for everybody. So let me do that. Let me spotlight. Or maybe that I don't you have one. Anyway. Nope, okay. got you. I got you. <laughs> um, I just want to say thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, as a starter, um, it's just so, uh, it, it's fun, but it's also kind of an honor to see people from all over the country joining this conversation and, and, and hopefully a fun evening of sketching together. And I especially welcome the young kids who are here because that's really who this book is for. Um, and I, I love uh, having the opportunity to work with kids and do some sketching together. So that's what we have planned. Um, and I, so I did start um, drawing when I was, um, when I was a kid, I really did like it, but I, um, and I drew, um, you know, right through elementary school and middle school and high school. And I took some art classes in college um, but I didn't really think that I was going to become an artist, whatever that might mean. I didn't think I was going to be able to make a living from that. And so I went and, you know, took a different career path. But I've always stayed, um, I've always liked drawing and painting. And so it's definitely become a big part of my life. And it's, it's a way for me to stay connected with what's happening around me. I love to be outside and sketching outside the things that I see. And I wanna share some of that with you tonight. And um, especially now that we 
are in this pandemic and we're spending so much time kind of indoors or alone or on Zoom things, I find that being able to get outside, um, whether I'm just hiking or I'm hiking with a sketchbook, um, is definitely part of what keeps me feeling healthy and grounded and hopeful about where things are going. And it kind of expands myself, my sense of like life in the world. So I love that about it. And hopefully some of you do too. Yeah. Well, great. Yeah, I think it's, uh, so, so you, you didn't, you don't have a formal art background is what you're saying, right? Like you took, you take some classes, but you, you're not a, a formally trained artist. Yeah, you know, I think in fairness, I took enough classes that I, I had a lot of really good basics. Okay. And, um, and those things have served me very well um, throughout the years. Um, but I'm not a fine artist and I don't make a living as an artist either. I actually work in partnership with the National Park Service um, here in New York State along the Erie Canal. And I have a background in environmental education and um, so that's kind of where the, the art piece and the environment piece and nature really merge. And um, I just wanna give a plug too for the Columbia Land Conservancy because um, like probably many of you, like I go out in my backyard, but I also look for unique places where I can hike, where I can enjoy nature, where I can look at birds, where I can sketch. And I go to the local preserves all the time. Um, and I always have, whether here or other places that I was living. And so I just feel like the role of a land conservancy is so important in preserving open spaces, farmland, woodland, um, the places that really kind of nurture us. And so, um, so thanks to you, Heidi, and you know, just also for having me too, because it is just such important work. And so um, if you have a land trust near you, I hope you'll, you know, look into it or, or get involved or make a donation. That yeah, that's a really good point. I think um, we, we all have, you know, probably places nearby that we can go to. So thank you for, for giving us a plug. So uh, I wonder if you couldn't show us a few pages of your sketchbook, you know, before we get started. And that yeah. way we can kind of see. And so let me switch spotlights. Okay, great. And okay, good. Um, so this is the book and the cover of the book, but I'm going to show you um, what I take into the field with me. And I'd love to show you some of the things that I really love to draw. And then, and then you can also feel free to ask questions at any time. And I can, you know, I can just talk and show things at the same time. Um, so one of the things that I love to draw, and I always have, I love to draw trees. And I especially like big trees that almost don't fit on the page um, because I just think they're so interesting. And sometimes I don't really have time to paint the whole tree. So one of the things I like to do is paint the background and all these interesting spaces that are happening around the branches. So that's one thing I really like. I also really enjoy drawing insects. And so these are um, mostly moss that are attra were attracted to my backyard, my back porch light. And so in the summertime, I leave the porch light on. And if I leave it on all night, when I come out in the morning, usually there's a whole slew of moss that are there that have been hanging out under the porch light. And so I have a couple of different pages like this. And almost every time I go out, each month there are different things that are there. And so I might do you know, one thing one day and come back the next night and there's something different and I do a few more until I just sort of fill up a page with different insects. So I like that too. Um, I like to take my sketchbook out when I'm walking in the field. And so this is a page mostly of weeds that are growing um, out in the field right next to my house with different interesting plants and stuff. And you can see here that I like to go outside all year long. Here's when I went out last December and it was 37 degrees. So I, um, I do try to see now how cold can it be and I can still go outside. Um, it's one of the things that I kind of like to do. So this is a winter sketch 
And usually I don't paint outside in the field or add any color. I just use a pen and I sketch outside and then I come back inside and I draw inside. And I'm out when I'm out there, I love kind of the sense of uh, discovery or it's almost like a treasure hunt for me because I don't necessarily know what I'm gonna find until I'm out there poking around. So one of the things that I do always look for is bird nests because I love to draw them and I think that they're just really beautiful. And they tell me about what birds are in my backyard or in my neighborhood and, and where they're nesting. So this was a, a nest that I found last January while I was outside um, and uh, had some fun sketching this one. So Jean, how many of these uh, sketchbooks do you have? <laughs> I have a few. <laughs> I have a few. And, um, you know, so I have a shelf full and I'd say I have been drawing in sketchbooks for many years. Um, probably I do at least one sketch every week, sometimes two, but that's about what I have time for. Um, so. So and over the over the years, you you mentioned that you know you you're sort of testing yourself to see how cold you can be or how cold it can get and still sketch. What's what's your um, lowest temperature? Well, it's a great question. I think I have a page that's nineteen. Oof. Um, but I only made it ten minutes um, <laughs> on that day. <laughs> so uh, it's a lot. Depends on the wind too. Um, sure. Yeah. So do you, do you, you sketch it with pencil and then you come back and you refine it when you get back inside, but at first you're doing pencil? That's my first question. My second is, uh, did you study calligraphy? Because this writing is amazing. Um, that's a great question. So um, I actually, tonight we're going to use a pencil, but when I go outside most of the time, I don't use a pencil. I just use a pen and I jump in and I sketch in pen. And um, so it, it cuts out a step for me of like pencil and refining. Um, I just wanna get right in there and work it. Um, and have I studied calligraphy? Yes, um, but I'll tell you how I got started, especially for the kids on this Zoom. Uh, when I was growing up, um, we used to make all the birthday cards and Christmas cards and cards for anybody at any holiday. We never bought them. So um, I made a lot of birthday cards and a lot of Christmas cards. And I think when I was in about fourth or fifth grade, I looked at some of the cards that people sent us. And I thought, wow, that's a really fancy way of writing Merry Christmas. I wonder if I could copy that. So I started copying the fancier letters that I saw on greeting cards. And then later, I got some calligraphy pens and fooled around with those. And now I, you know, I've studied handwriting and lettering and calligraphy and stuff like that. And now I kind of like a combination of a looser, like a hand drawn letters. Yeah. So this was a page I did last spring. And there's some themes that like come back around over and over again in my sketchbooks. And um, I always am looking like for the first sign of the season. And so skunk cabbage, that's what this plant is. And this is the flowers of this plant. And they come up in like, you could go, you could, I could find them now, like February and March is when this plant blooms. And it's named skunk cabbage because the flowers have a kind of not so great smell. Um, but this is one of the plants that I often have in my sketchbook every spring. Sometimes I just paint colors. So last April, I was feeling like the world was just so brown. <laughs> like there still wasn't any color because it really hasn't, like spring really hadn't come yet. So I thought, well, I wonder how many different shades of brown I could do in my sketchbook. And that's what this page is about. And so you were, you were looking at things in nature and... Yeah, so there's beech trees and oak leaves and moss in my lawn and corn stubbles. There's um, turkeys, wild turkeys, moss on the fence, cherry bark, goldenrod stems, some walnut shells, song sparrows, red osier dogwood, there's cattails. So all these different things that were brown and all these different shades of brown. Yeah. Um, and this, <laughs> this page is, um, 
I, I was, he, I was working from home last spring after COVID hit and I was um, just home so much that it gave me the opportunity to really dive in and learn more about what was happening in my own yard because I wasn't leaving it every day to go to an office. So I started noticing more of like the birds that were at my feeders and then the birds like where were they singing from, where, were, where, were I see, where was I seeing some nesting activity. So I made a bird map of my whole yard and I put in the names of different birds that and where I was seeing them. So, um, so that was kind of a fun thing to be able to do just because of being home and paying attention more. That's amazing, yeah. Yeah. And so for your, for the Nature Explorer sketchbook, uh, how, how did you decide what to put in it and, and thinking about how to get started in this process? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So um, I was offered this opportunity to write this book and I was thinking about what kinds of things should go in it and how do I decide and what are the things that kids would see right in their own backyard that they might want to draw. Um, so this is kind of how I start something like that. And this is a tool that you can use for yourself too. I made a list of things that I thought I might want to draw. So you can almost see this word ideas. So I have birds and insects and maybe I'd want to do um, some how to mix up colors. And then I wrote bees, ants, grasshoppers, um, praying mantises, stick bugs, ladybugs, caterpillars. I was trying to list all the things I could think of that would be in your backyard that you might find. And then I, um, I made these little, what I call a thumbnail sketch of how I might put some images together on a page. So this was a page of beach stuff. And then I drew this page and I did a bird feeder and a little bird and a pine cone. And I was trying to think about how would I do that and also have some words on the page so that it would explain what you were supposed to see or do or whatever. And I liked this bird feeder idea here. So I did it again. And this time I put another bird with it. And then I did it again and I kind of moved that concept a little forward and I did it again and I thought, okay, this bird feeder thing, I'm liking where this is going. So let me, let me do something more with that. So then from there, I do like a pencil sketch like this. And so here you can see at least half of the page start to take shape. And I thought, well, maybe this up on top would be a place to put some of the text for the page. And, you know, so from there, then I painted this. And I'll show you what the page looks like. So you kind of go from that small idea to a bigger page. And here you can see my what to sketch list. So even some of the ideas for that I was having of what do I want to put in the book was also something that came through in like, what are the things that you could sketch? And so if you're not, sh if you're not sure how to get started or what you might sketch, maybe starting with a list of ideas of things that you'd like to look for outside or things that you'd like to find or things that you're curious about um, is a good place to start. Um, and so there's my goldfinch of, and how that came about. Yeah, that's great. I think, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a very early, you know, I'm a, a basic, uh, nature journal or in some ways, but I think that's, that is one of the stumbling blocks is knowing what to sketch. And then I think somebody else also asked about sort of what to bring with you or what, what sort of tools do you need yeah. um, when you go out to explore and sketch? And I think you touched on it a little bit, but what do you use? Yeah, let me show you some of my tools. And I'll just say, um, this spider was one of the controversial things about this sketchbook page of whether to put in the spider. So if you um, wanted to put in the chat, yes to the spider or no to the spider. I like these garden spiders because they have this zigzaggy web and I think they're really kind of cool and they're yellow. And so it kind of went with the yellow bird. But my son said, mom, 
you cannot have that spider in there. He's terrifying. Please don't put him in. You'll scare kids off. Um, but I overrode him in the end. So I'm glad to see some comments in there coming in. Yes to the spiders. That's great. I'm glad. I'm glad. <laughs> Let him know that he was over overruled. Well, and they play such an important part in the, you know, in nature and and they're yeah, just, yeah, they're well, really there. Really you see them. I think, um, yeah. So when I'm out, I, I try to bring very few things because I don't want to carry a lot. So I, I have a, a pencil usually, although what I often start with is this kind of a pen. It's called the Micron pen. And um, I told Heidi that I will send a, like a, a list of some of the materials that I use most often so that if you have specific questions about what kind of brushes or what kind of pencils or those kinds of things. Yeah, and we'll send a follow-up email with yeah. a link to the recording and then also to the list of resources. Yeah, so I might bring a small set of colored pencils. Um, I have a small eraser that you can need and that's how it gets clean. And so I like those. Um, and, you know, mostly that's kind of it. I also, um, I'm a watercolor artist and this is what my watercolor kit looks like. It's very comp, it's very compact and it opens up like this and those are the paints. Um, and so I love, I love the fact that everything can fold up really small um, and that it's easy to carry with me no matter where I am. But I would say that this is probably the most important thing that you need to have because that's really where it starts, right? Is that you go out, you're walking and you say, what am I curious about? What am I gonna find that's interesting? Um, and sometimes I just find something that I've never seen before or that looks sort of different or that I have a question about and that's how I start. And that's how I say, I'm going to sketch this and then I'll figure everything else out from there. So why don't we try a little sketching together? Right. All you need is a, is a pencil. That's what we're going to use tonight. And a little curiosity. And I'm going to, I'm going to do some things right from the Nature Explorer sketchbook. Um, so. I think there were also some questions on if you had any sketchbook recommendations or what you use. Yeah, you know what? I, I, I do and I don't. Um, I'll say this. Um, I use a brand called Stillman and Byrne and I like them a lot because they've got hard cover and soft cover and they hold up well in the field and they've got lots of different kinds of paper. But, you know, when I was starting out, I loved a ring bound sketchbook because you can open it and it lays really flat. Um, so I think that's, that works really well. Um, I think you've got to experiment a little bit, but what I would say is don't skimp too much on the paper. If the paper is not good, your results aren't gonna be that good. So, you know, there's lots of different sketch papers that are fine for pencil and, and colored pencil, but as soon as, if you want to add watercolor, then you want to get paper that's heavier and, and really kind of suitable for watercolor. So I brought along tonight some collections that we could work with. And this is one of them. So I have some beach stuff and um, some things uh, might work better than others. So maybe we'll, maybe we'll try this for starters. So I'm gonna do an activity here tonight that's in the sketchbook and it's around training your hands to draw what your eyes see. And so what we're going to do first is we're going to draw blind, which means that we'll look at the um, we'll look at the, the starfish, but try not to look at your pencil or your paper at all. So I got to get to a, a blank page in my sketchbook. Let's start with this one. And I'm going to put this here so you can see it. And I'm going to just try looking right at this and drawing over here. Now, the thing in this is that when you do this, you're really just trying to pretend almost like your pencil is crawling along the edge of the starfish. 
And when you look at your starfish afterwards, you might say, oh my goodness, it's a mess and it's supposed to be. So the lines, you might run right off the paper and that's totally fine. Um, but Heidi, why don't you yeah. give us um, no more than a minute for this, okay? All right. So we'll just try it, see where we get. All right, go ahead. You can crawl right on the outside. You can crawl inside a little bit if you want to. Um, let's, for, for this, I think sometimes it's good to work a little bit slowly and just really be looking. And sometimes when I'm doing this, I notice things that I wouldn't have seen if I just thought, all right, I'm gonna draw a starfish. Like I notice that there's all these little tiny circular raised ridges on this starfish. And they seem to just go across and across at um, kind of regular, regularly spaced along here. Um, I notice now, and I and I hadn't really noticed this before. There's almost like a little circular ring in the middle. All right, that's a minute. That's a minute. All right, give us another thirty seconds or so. Let us see. If all we right, can, you got it. See if I can make it all the way around. <laughs> <laughs> I got to speed up my pencil here, but. All right, you did it. Wow, not bad. Okay, so that is a blind, it's called a blind sketch. And usually if I do one of those, I like to label it. So you can write right next to it, blind. And that way, if you come back and look at this later or you share it with somebody else, you can say, look at this awesome sketch I made without even looking at the paper at all. How great is that? Okay, so now we're gonna try doing, um, let's see what we can do in 30 seconds. This time you can look at your paper and you can look at this, the starfish, um, but you're gonna work pretty fast and we'll see how much you can do in 30 seconds. Do you wanna stay with the same one or should I go down a size? No, we'll stay with the same, let's do the big guy. Yeah. Okay. Are and you if, ready? You know, you can also like, if you go right over your other one, that's fine too. I'm gonna to just work right on the same page so you can still see it. Okay, ready for 30 seconds? Do you wanna time us? I'm ready, whenever you are. All right, go. All right, time's up. Okay, now let's put 30 seconds right on that one. So we know, all right, great. Um, now we're gonna do this again and we're gonna do 60 seconds. So you have a whole minute and I'm gonna move this over here. A little more space this time. Actually, I'll tell you what, I'm gonna actually, I'm gonna move it in a little different position so we I have to do it again. Okay. All right, ready when you are. All right, go. Okay. Wanna come with me?
Okay, time's up. Okay. All right, now we'll put a little 60 second on that guy. So this is a good, a good thing that you can do with any subject at all. Um, and it does sort of train your eyes and your hands to work together. And sometimes um, I think it also shows that you don't need a ton of time to actually make some marks on the paper. Um, I actually almost like my 30 seconds more than my 60 seconds here. And you might like, you might like your blind more than you like your 60 seconds. Um, so as you saw, like I really didn't use an eraser. And if I don't like a line, I just draw right over it. I just draw another one. And what happens when you do that is that you, um, you sort of keep in the flow of your line moving on the paper and you are less critical. So if you wanted to set, if, you, if I wanted to draw that starfish and I, and I said to myself, I wanna draw a perfect starfish. then as soon as I'd start drawing, I'd say, I'd start to say to myself, oh, I think that line isn't quite right. Let me erase it. Then you erase. Then you start drawing again. Then you erase. And now you break the flow of the way your hand is moving, the way your eyes are seeing it, because you're constantly kind of saying to yourself, it doesn't look right, it doesn't look right. So I'd really encourage you um, to try to let go of having something look perfect and just get the flow of lines down on paper when you're starting out. And, and, and Jean, oh, sorry. go ahead. Well, no, I was just gonna say, I think that this is a good example too. You know, you have this collection and I'm sure a lot of people on this call have their own collections. And so this is an activity that one could do inside, you know, and especially on these cold days and practice uh, some of these skills. Yep, yep. Yeah, it's a great it's a great way to practice. Um, and so, if you have a collection, um, or if you're here with uh, with kids and you have a collection, I'd love to know what it is. So you could put that in the chat. Like I collect rocks, or I collect shells, or whatever it is. Um, and you know, even if you collect Lego guys, you could draw those too. And it's good drawing practice. So just it doesn't have to be nature when you're starting out drawing anything uh, just kind of gets you in the habit of sketching. So actually, let's try a little bit of a collection um, because it can be really fun to do a collection page. So I'll show you what that looks like in the Nature Explorer sketchbook. I did a collection because um, I love these kind of pages where I start with one thing and then I find something. So here I I started collecting seeds of different kinds of trees. And I actually started this page because I was visiting California and I saw this seed pod and I thought, what the heck is that? That is not something I've ever seen and not something that we, we don't have this tree um, in the East. So then I went looking for other things as I was traveling around and I found the eucalyptus seeds and um, this kind of oak that is, it's also very different kind of an acorn than we have. This is the one that we would have here. So then I came back to New York State and I thought, all right, I'm gonna keep this going and see how many different tree seeds I can find and sketch on the page. And then some of them I knew what they were and some of them I had to do some hunting to try to figure it out. So uh, why don't we, I'm gonna get another blank page here. And I'll show you a little bit of how you could build out a collection page. So this time, let's start with this shell. And um, it's the shell of a blue mussel. And it's probably rather old. I think I got it a number of years ago, probably in Maine. So if I'm going to put a collection on a page, I like to think about where, where do I want to start? Where's, that, where am I, where's my first blue mussel going to go? I could put it here, I could put it anywhere. So sometimes I just take the object and I put it where I think I want it on the page. Maybe I want it there, maybe I want it there. So I think in this case, I'm gonna start over here and I'm gonna put it in this corner. And part of the reason I'm gonna do that is that then I still have this whole big part of the page to add things to. 
if I put it right in the middle, then I've got like little spaces to work with. So I'm gonna put it right there while I'm drawing it, but I'm gonna actually draw it down here. So let's just spend a minute or less or so. And we're just gonna put the shell in because we're just trying to see what it would be like to do a collection. One of the things I like about these shells is the way they kind of break down and they uh, give you kind of interesting shapes and colors along the, the ridge of it. Yeah, different textures too. Yeah. And I like the way that they grow in this ringed sort of way out here. Okay. So now I have that first thing. All right, let's pick something else from the, the shell collection here. All right, so here we've got, um, this is a sea urchin case. And it's, um, these guys are related to starfish. So now the question is where do we wanna put that thing? Um, so I wanna, ask for a volunteer, maybe one of the kids that are on the call to unmute and tell me where you would like to put this object. I don't, I, I don't have access to see all of you. So, um, so I'm going to just call on Terrence Duvall. Do you and your daughter want to tell me where you want me to put this next? Should we put it up here or over here or? What do you think? Where there, should the what do you think? Case go? I think it should go um, on the right of the page on the top. Uh, you want it over here or do you want it on this page? Um, the other one. I think you just had it there. Yeah. Right. Okay. That's where it's going. Sounds good. Thank you. All right. All right. Thanks. Okay, so let's put it in. And I'm going to need to move it over here just so I can see it. Let's see if I can get it to be more solid for you. Okay, how's that? Looks good. So you can start with the inside of this thing if you want and work out. And depending on what view you're probably And because this is, um, it's related to the sea stars, they kind of have five arms. They're just fused to the rest of the shell. You can kind of count them. Um, they're a little bit darker than the other ones than uh, the ones in between, but there really are just lots of, lots of dots on these that make them kind of fun. I'm just going to go ahead and put just a little bit of shading in there because that'll make it look like there's like it's got some holes in there. Okay. All right, so there's that one. Um, now let's see. Okay, I'm going to pick a hard one here at the moment. It's this thing. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> and we're not going to take a lot of time to draw this, so it, it's going to be one of those sort of messy things. But um, if you know what this is, put it in the chat. But I'm not going to tell you until after. And so I think because this has got this nice curvy shape to it, I'm going to put it here and it's going to come right down and cross over the, the page. So I'm going to put it over here so you can see it, hopefully. Mm. Good job, Karen. Okay, so with this, I'm looking mostly at the shape of it and I'm just gonna kind of draw a line for it that curves around and then I'm just gonna add these little things coming out. So, um, so that's my first, my first line. And it actually is kind of connected. It has this connected thread that runs through the whole thing. Mm 
And then there's these cool things that come out from it. And they're like these little discs, kind of paper-like. And you probably can't see them from where you are, but they, they've got these little ridges. Each one of these curves has a sort of a ridge to it. And I'm, I'm kind of changing up as I go, just making a, a little bit of corrections for where I want, where I want this to, to be. So even if my original line isn't perfect, it's really okay. I can just change it as I'm going. Okay. I always think these things are so cool. Um, when I find them on the beach, I just love them. So um, I did see somebody say they think it's an egg case. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that is correct. So inside here Shoot. <laughs> are tiny shells. And when those little guys grow up, they grow up to be this. Wow. <laughs> so this um, is the egg case of a whelk. And if you were to split open these little tiny pods inside of here, you would find like Oh, and you can see them, but they're so tiny. They're like less than an eighth of an inch, perfectly formed whelk shells. These, these guys, perfectly just tiny, tiny, tiny. And then as they grow, they, you know, their shells grow and they get bigger and bigger. So this one is obviously a pretty old um, whelk. That's what that is. All right. Um, Let's try, maybe we'll try um, one more thing. And I, I think this whelk is a little complicated. So I'm gonna see, oh, I know what else I have. That's cool. So I'm gonna put the whelk away, but um, I have this thing. I, it's in two pieces now, but I think he's great. Isn't he great? So if you know what this is, you can put that in the chat. So now I say, all right, where do I want this to go on the page? And I think for this one, I'm gonna have him coming down right around here somewhere. So if it's all right with you, I'm gonna move him here. But I'm gonna draw him like this, all right? So again, you kind of just look at the, the major, whoops, I gotta move them over a little more. I look at the major shape of this thing. It's almost like, um, it's, it's almost, it's not really a circle. It's not really, it's not really a perfect oval, but you could start with something like this. Like maybe it's almost like a teardrop shape. And once I have that and I put in that lovely tail, then I can cut it because it's not quite in half, but do something like that. And then this is really more squared off than it is round. And I think we better put some spikes on this guy because that's part of what makes him pretty cool. Okay. 
Okay. So now we have that guy. So now, you know, there's a lot of different things you can kind of do with a collection page like this. One is to ask yourself, like, do I know what these things are? And maybe you want to write down a little bit about each one or what you learned, or maybe you just want to label what it is. So um, this is a blue muscle. So I think I'll just write that next to it. Only I'm going to write it big this time. And this is a horseshoe crab. So you could write that anywhere over here. Let's write it right here. So when you kind of, when you label things and you give them, right, and this, that's our sea urchin. I kind of like it when things are circular and you can write along the edges, but I think with this one, I think I'll do sea urchin and write something on the top and the bottom. And then for this, one thing that I um, have to pay attention to, because this happens in my sketchbooks and, and it happens in the Nature Explorer sketchbook, I like to cross the page like this, but I don't want to put anything too important in there. And I don't want to put a word in there because I'm going to get stuck in between the pages. So I have to think about that. So let's just put a whelk egg case, and this is W-H-E-L-K. So the question, is it important to keep the proportions right? I think that's up to you. You know, I do, I do tend to try to be accurate when I'm sketching things, but when you're learning, I, I think that you can decide whether you need to be or whether you just want to um, really just put things on the page and enjoy what you're doing and not be too hung up or worried about whether it's all accurate or all in the right proportions or that kind of thing. Um, so I, I think it's, it's kind of up to you. But so that's basically, you know, how you build out a collection page. And then you've got, you know, you can see like there's a lot of space right here. I could add a whole bunch more here. I could add more here. I could add more here. And you might want to give a title to your page in the end, or you might want to put down what beach you were at when you found these things or what the weather was like. Um, or, you know, there are other things that you can put on your page too. And I think with the next sketch that we're going to do, we're going to try an activity about questions and asking a lot of questions. So I'm going to put the beach stuff away and pull out a different collection for you to work with that we'll work with next. And do you want to see if anyone would like to share their drawing so oh, far? Yeah, yeah, let's do that now and then oh. we'll do it again after the next set. So we'll do the beach right. one. Um, so can we, can you go to like a, um, let's see, a gallery? Remember? maybe let's see I remove the spotlight and all right are you do you have gallery view yeah so it might be that everybody has to click their own gallery view up in the right part and put your video on if you don't have it already um, but if you're brave enough to share what you've been, what you've worked on uh, either from the first sketch of the starfish or the second one that'd be great all right. Oh, good. Wow, look at that. Oh, Bernice, that's very nice. Very yeah. nice. Carol, beautiful. Parents and Ramona, too. Wow. All right, I got to go to the second. Get the I know. <laughs> There's three pages of people. <laughs> I know. I know. All right, great. Oh, that's beautiful. Jayla, that looks gorgeous. Beautiful. Oh. Super nice. Oh, yeah. See, this is the hardest thing about Zoom is that um, if we were in person, you could, you know, really walk around 
Oh, Annetta, that's awesome. Uh, you know, you could really just walk around and and uh, enjoy the differences of all of your work. And I really miss that. So it's nice to at least see a little bit of what you've done. Yeah. I appreciate your sharing that. Sometimes it's hard to do when you're first starting out because you feel like, hmm, what if it doesn't look good? You know, or you don't, it might not be exactly what you want it to be. Um, but I, you know, it's your sketchbook. So you can decide whether you want to share it, whether you don't. And I find um, that the more I've shared my sketchbooks, um, the better I get. And I find that I end up sharing stories along with the sketches because you know, sometimes people will say, oh, I want to tell you about a, a time when I found one of those sea urchins at the beach and they tell me a story about their experience at the beach. And then I can talk about something that I find. Um, and it's happened with trees and bird eggs and all kinds of things that, that I share in my sketchbook and, and people have great stories about their experiences. So I encourage you to um, take the leap and, and uh, sketch and also share what you do. All right, so um, another thing that I, um, so I have a number, I have a number of collections. And this is kind of a cool one that I wanna share with you. Sometimes I find things myself and a lot of times people give me things because they know that I like to sketch. Um, so this is something that um, a friend of mine who's a college student sent in the mail to me. Wait till you see this. This friend of mine um, loves insects. And this Ooh. is a collection <laughs> that she made of insects. And she had so many that she decided to give me some because she didn't need these anymore. And she thought I would like to see them and paint them. <laughs> and so what a cool thing to get in the mail, huh? And then you don't have to worry about them flying away while you're trying to paint them. No, you don't. Um, <laughs> so I will admit that I have never sketched that uh, scorpion. And I don't know that I really need to. Um, but, but I have painted all of these things and this too. So um, one of the things that's in the Nature Explorer sketchbook, um, I do have some, you know, kind of drawing tips, and this is a page about drawing insects. And um, so I thought we would try this tonight. So when you're seeing an insect, whether it's a dragonfly or a butterfly or a regular fly or anything, they all have three body parts. And it really helps if you know that they have three body parts and what they are and what goes where. So they all have a head and that's where the eyes are and where any antenna come off of the head. Then they have this middle section called the thorax. And this is where the wings attach. And this is also where the legs attach. So that's good to know, because sometimes it's a little bit hard to see and you might wanna put the wings down here or the legs you think should be here, but really they're attached up here. Um, and then this is the abdomen. And the abdomen often looks like it's divided into a number of segments there'll be little lines across here. You'll see that a lot on dragonflies and on um, lightning bugs and on some butterflies too. Um, so although these different parts look different on all the gazillions of insects that are in the world, they're always, they're always those three. So let's take a look at this. I'm gonna work in a, on just a pad of paper so I can lay it flat and, and you can see it better. So what if we do this, this big guy? Um, and I'm wondering if maybe, I'm just gonna try to zoom in just a little bit on it so you can see it better. Mm, okay, how's that? Looks good. Okay, great. So you can see that um, there are some antenna coming off the head. And um, this is a kind of, this is a kind of moth. So it's also kind of furry looking. And then you see this abdomen part is divided into some different sections. So, and then we've got wings. 
So as we're, as we're doing this, I want to think about um, writing questions this time. So rather than saying, oh, this is a such and such, and it does this, um, one thing I like to start with is just, oh, what are all the questions I might have about this particular moth? So if you have a question that you think would be interesting to find out about this moth, you can put that in the chat. And then one thing that we might do is actually put the questions right on the page. So um, we've got a little bit of time left. So why don't we start with um, trying to sketch this moth. And I'm going to start in the middle with the body parts. And um, sometimes what I'll do is actually measure something like this with a ruler. For tonight, I'm not going to do that. Um, but maybe I'll start with the middle part, that thorax of just kind of putting that in. It's a kind of kind of looks squarish to me. And then from the head looks more like it's kind of comes out like a triangle. And then um, I can see that the eyes come off that triangle, sort of like this. Um, so I think I'll also put a line kind of right down the center of this guy so I see about where that is. And then we can put on that final piece. And it kind of gets narrower toward the bottom. Mine probably a little long. Okay, so now we've got them. The three main parts are right in there. So now if we're gonna put the wings in, we know that they have to come off of this middle part. And even though these back ones down, they're gonna start up here. So sometimes I might look at like, well, how far out do the wings look in terms of like how wide they are compared to how that body part middle is. And one thing you can do is use your pencil sometimes to measure and I just go like that and I say, all right, it goes in the middle out to the L on my pencil or out to there. And then I could mark that on my paper. So I see that my wing is gonna be out Let's see, let's do it again, almost to here. So I can kind of just eyeball in where that's going to go. And I could also do the same down here and just say, well, like, is it, do these wings come down halfway to the, to the bottom of the tail or for way down? They're about halfway. So the lower wings are going to come down around here. And that just kind of gives me a ballpark to shoot for. Um, I think sometimes doing wings are, are a little challenging. Um, takes, takes a little practice, I think, to get it. So here again, you can kind of modify it as you go. But I'll just do that. And then, you know, this is the point where I might check it and say, mm, you know, does it look like the wings are kind of shaped the right way? Do I want to refine them a little bit? Um, tonight, I'm, I'm just going to leave the, um, well, well, you know, so this is where I could take that a little bit out, but I don't really feel like erasing a whole lot. I'm just going to keep drawing right over the lines. And now I might count, and, and it's a little bit maybe harder for you to see, but there are one, two, three, four, five, five kind of orangey segments here and then and then this bottom tip. So I'm just gonna go ahead and kind of divide it into five parts. And then one of the parts I really do love to do is the antenna. I think they're just so fun to put in and they kind of really will make your your bug look look right when you put those in. I like the way that they swarm like that. 
Okay, so um, I'm wondering, Heidi, if you would read some of the questions that have come in through the chat about this guy. Sure, so we have, wow, we, we got a lot of great questions. Where does this moth live? Okay. How does it hide from predators? Mm. What is it called? Is it active during the day or night? Mm. Great. What does it eat as an adult? What does the caterpillar eat? And then there was some other, some, some answers to some of those questions. I want to know what the caterpillar looks like. Yeah. Okay. That's a great one. Were there any other questions from the group? How long does it live? Mm. How about, I wonder what eats it? <laughs> mm. Yeah. Mm. So that's great. Um, because when you start to ask questions, um, then that thing just starts to get so much more interesting. Because it's not just about what it is, but it's about why is it here? And how does it live? And what else does it rely on? And how is it maybe connected to you in ways that you had no idea? Like maybe there's things that you have in your yard that it eats and it needs to live or that the caterpillars need. Um, so I think like asking the questions and then that really kind of helps lead to really good connections. Um, we could add a little bit of color to this too. Um, I don't know if some of you have colored pencils or um, markers or something like that. Um, maybe we wanna just put a little bit of color in there too. So while I'm doing this, are there questions about um, keeping a nature journal or um, how you do, you know, how you could, um, you know, sketch outside where you live or just any, any questions I'd be really happy to answer um, along the way here. One thing that I think is fun is just to add just a little color in it. Again, like it doesn't have to be perfect, um, but sometimes it just kind of livens up a sketch in a nice way. And I don't have, I don't have an orange here in my um, pack. So I'm just kind of mixing a little bit of colored pencils of yellow and red together right on the page because that will make it look at least a little bit orange. And then I need some brown to go in between. So Jean, uh, if you said earlier that you when you go out to, to draw in nature that you often use a pen. And mm -hmm. there was a question earlier about what size the pen was, or if you have a preference. Yep. Um, I use pens that you can, um, that are waterproof so that I can paint right on top of the ink. And I use a Micron pen and the size I like is a size zero two. And I also have a very small size called a zero zero five. But a lot of people, they, they come in in different widths and you can kind of experiment to see, you know, what you like best. You can buy them singly um, at almost any art supply store or even like a craft store will have them. Or you can buy a set and it will have, you know, five or six different ones and you can kind of see what do you like the best. So I'd say experiment um, because what I like might not end up being what you like. And then in that, you know, 
same idea and how you are filling in with color now, you generally, or this time of year, I think you, you mentioned to me the other day that you generally draw in the pen and then fill in with color when you get home. Uh, how yeah. do you remember what colors things are? Um, if you want to be accurate. Uh, yeah, I sometimes take a picture um, or I might make some notes right on my page. So for this, I might do if I wasn't coloring in the field and in the summertime, I often bring paints right with me, but I might draw an arrow like that and write over here orange. Um, and then I would draw like that and I would say brown. And that I would try to do in pencil because then I could erase that later. I could make some little notes about color. So that's another thing to do. Um, the other thing that's sort of helpful for me is that because I love details and I love to paint and draw detailed things, sometimes I have a hard time like backing off from that. So if I, if I sketch in the field and then I come in and paint, it takes away a lot of the details. And sometimes my my work is better when I don't have like when I don't have access to the super detailed things. I like it both ways, really. But um, but you know you don't always have to have everything, you know, perfectly accurate. Like with this, you know, it's kind of nice. Like there is this this lighter part down here in the wings, and it's um, you know it might be nice to have that in there in the final piece of knowing that there's a little bit of a, of a white there. But does it matter if everything around it is really gray or if it's a little something different? Not so much. Um, I, I have and I do like to do kind of oh, like botanical, almost like uh, natural history illustration sketches. And when I do those, I do want everything to be very accurate. And so then I, I rely on photos and that looks a little greenish. Um, I rely on photos to do stuff. I um, use specimens whenever I have them. I love to use a specimen for things. It really helps a lot. Um, and um, if I'm drawing birds, I might draw birds right from my feeder and also from photographs and also from specimens so that I have as much information as I can. So there's a question about the nest that you showed in your book. Um, and the question is, what kind of nests can you look down on like that? All the nests I see are high up in the trees. Mm. Um, well, birds nest at all different levels. So sometimes you do find ones that are lower down like that. Um, and um, that is, I, I'm not exactly sure, but I think that's some kind of a sparrow's nest that I found. And it was really like probably four feet off the ground um, in this little cluster of pine trees. And I just I just happened to spy it. So that was pretty lucky. Um, this fall, you know, whenever the leaves fall off, I go nest hunting and I and I um, try to draw the nests that I find around my yard and down the road and stuff. And I'm still finding ones like even now that I that I've walked past every day for a year or like for, you know, for six months or something. And I'm, and I'm, you know, like it snowed. And so suddenly there's a mound of snow on top of the nest. I'm like, oh, there's four more nests in that wetland that I've walked past all the time and had no idea. Like I, I know there are birds nesting in there, but suddenly I realized that nest is only six feet off the road. And it's yeah. two feet off the ground. So it's, it's cool. I'm, you know, I'm still looking even now for stuff. Well, I was going to say in the Northeast, you know, in, in New York here, when, we, when it does snow, that is a great time to go looking for nests because, you know, if all the, the snow comes off all the branches and everything of, of the, yep. the trees, you can definitely see them. They stand out. I have a couple in my yard that are, um, you know, they definitely yep. stand out. So yeah, the next question, find oh, all the hiding places. Yeah. Um, the next question is, do you look for answers to your questions? Oh, you bet I do. Yep. Um, so I love these questions and I, um, I like asking the questions and I like finding the answers. So um, when, I, when I come home, I look in, I have a lot of field guides. I have a lot of books about nature, all different topics. I go to the library and I take out books and I use the internet a lot. So for something like this, 
let's say I had no idea what it was. So we wanted to answer the first question of like, what is it? And because all these other questions, we may not be able to answer unless we know what it is. So I might search for large brown moth, New York State. And I would put that into the internet. And then I'd look at images and I'd see what comes up. Um, and then I might learn something like, if you want to identify moths, you really need to know how many, you know, some other thing about them. And then, and then I might not know that. So it's, it's particularly true with mushrooms. Um, so I love to draw mushrooms too. And um, I'm going to show you a page from the Nature Explorer sketchbook that I did. And it, and it has to do with this question thing. Um, let's see. Okay. I'm going to take my moth away for a second just to show you this. So one time, you know, like I found this big mushroom and I thought, oh my gosh, that's like the coolest thing. So I start to look it up and I look up large white mushrooms growing in the lawn and growing in a ring. And suddenly I find out that that's not enough. You have to go back and look a little more. So it'll say, does it have this veil on it? And now I've drawn it so I can say, oh, it has a veil. Um, and then it'll say, well, you need to know how these gills are attached. So then you're like, oh, I didn't look that carefully. Next time I go out looking at a mushroom, I need to look at how the gills are attached. Or I need to look at, does it have gills at all? Or is there something else happening there, like little tiny pores? <laughs> so, then, like, so then I learn that I can't even get to answer that first question of what is it until I've really looked at it even more. So here's another thing I learned. They'll say, well, what does it look like underground? Does it have this bulb at the bottom? And I'm like, I don't know. I didn't dig it up. I just looked at it. So next time I'm out there and there's a whole thing, I know I've got to pull one up a little bit and take a look at what's happening underground too. So I still have a hard time identifying mushrooms because there's so many and they're really are challenging. But I've learned a lot in the process of drawing them and asking questions. So things like, is it poisonous? What eats it? Why is it growing here? Um, and a lot of times too, it's interesting if you, if you cut a mushroom in half, it'll say, you know, if you want to know what this mushroom is, does it change color when you cut it? I didn't know mushrooms change color when you cut them. Sometimes they do. They turn blue or green or red. It's the coolest thing. Um, but I didn't know that until I started asking questions and looking it up. So that's one of the things I love about being a nature explorer is that you begin with that one thing, a mushroom, a moth, a butterfly, and then you see where it takes you. And sometimes it takes you around the world to some new place that you didn't even know you were connected to. And I find that a lot when I'm sketching um, roadside weeds and flowers and suddenly I find out, oh, this plant came from China or Japan or Russia. So that's, that's a good segue. There was a question about, can you talk a little bit about nature journaling in a very urban environment? Yep, yep. Um, I wonder, um, do you wanna keep the moth up so you can keep drawing that? Um, I'm happy to do that and just to answer questions too. Do you think that's working best, Heidi? Yeah, I think some people look like they, they might still be drawing, so. Okay, great. And I can move it a little bit too, so you can keep going. I'm gonna put my line in. Um, what do you do in an urban environment? Um, you know, there are a lot of people who are urban sketchers and they keep sketchbooks just like I do, only all of their pages are filled with things they find in urban places. And that's kind of cool too. So if you're an urban person more than a nature person, you should feel free to draw fire hydrants and um, stop signs and buildings. Um, but when I'm in an urban environment, I'm not really a big urban person. So I find that I'm always looking for nature and that I find it. So sometimes I find it in a park or I find it in some grass uh, on the side of the road or some plants that are growing in somebody's pots. 
or I go to a botanical garden or a zoo or a park where I'm going to find some more nature. Um, a lot of times urban parks have fabulous trees because they've been cultivated and they've been grown for a long, long time. And there's lots of different kinds of trees in urban parks. So that's where I first learned about trees was in a, in a city park um, that had a lot of different ones and they happened to have labels on them. So I bought myself a tree field guide and I decided that I really should know trees, that I should learn that. Um, and I'm so glad that I did. It was kind of a fun thing. And I still have that same field guide and I still have the same notes that I took. Um, and that was probably 30 years ago, at least. Yeah, there was a there was a response to that question and uh, with vacant lots, sidewalk cracks, ditches by the side of the road, be careful of traffic. Uh, outdoor potted plants might have small surprises growing in the soil under the plant. So yeah, mm -hmm. I think just like you said, if you start looking for nature, uh, you know, even in an urban setting, you're going to start to find it. Yeah, I mean, there are, um, you know, there are nests of hawks and peregrine falcons in New York City. There are often, you know, nature in unexpected places. So it is kind of about like just keeping your eye out and being aware of that stuff. But it might also, that might also be a question that you would start with. So let's say I went to the city. I might say, you know what? I want to see how many different birds I'm going to see in the city today. And I'm going to sketch everyone I can find a little tiny sketch. Um, so that's kind of gives me a purpose then of something I'm looking for. And it becomes almost like a scavenger hunt. So this is, this might be something that you could do if you are um, in different settings with kids is that you, you know, can create some different challenges of things that you want to find or things that you want to look for. Um, and that can, that can make it fun um, for everybody. So, and, and I like, you know, I think that's a fun one, whether you're in a, in a city environment or you are at a nature preserve. Great. Are there any more questions? So let's finish off this, um, this drawing and I'm going to show you a little bit of, um, well, we, well, we only have a minute. So I'm just going to show you quickly how I might draw a fancy letter for this moth. And this is, this is an easy thing that you can try too. So you can write the word moth like this. And then on every stroke that's down, every time you went down, you make that line thicker. So I went up here and now I'm going down and I make that thicker. And then O, I can make that down a little thicker. And the T. So this is called a line weight. And if you look at different fancy alphabets, this is one of the first things that you see is that some lines are thin and some lines are thick. So just by thickening up a line like that, it starts to make the word a little bit more interesting and maybe a little bit more beautiful. And then you can add something that's called a serif. And that's a little line at the bottom and at the top that you see on some letters. And that also can make your letters look just a little bit more interesting. And there's different kinds of them. So you'll, you might start to notice different alphabets now, how letters are shaped. Maybe you want to add something that's a little bit of a, a little extra flair, like sometimes in the O, I like to make a little curl like that inside of it. And then because this is a moth, maybe we want to do a little bit of a flying line like this. It's going to come through the moth, come down, and I'm going to make it go around my questions so that they're connected to that moth. And then flying them right back around like that. Maybe it's going to cross over because I have one more question over here. So that's sometimes how I add some fun things to the page. It's just that in the end, like, I see what this is. I have a bunch of questions and I've tied them together. Um, and now I have an interesting page about a moth. And you can see where I left part of it unfinished and sometimes that's a fun thing to do just to say like this is sort of how this sketch was made 
started with a pencil, a little bit of color, and then, you know, I could go back in and really finish this off and finish every part of it or just finish one part of it and make it very detailed. So there's lots of different ways of making a sketch and learning about something. And hopefully tonight um, you have learned a few things or, you know, come away with a few tips and a few techniques. I think the most important thing is, is to just start and continue and keep yourself curious so that you're out there and you're learning and you're connected and that you keep that connection to nature, which I think is so important. So maybe in the last minute or two, we could um, go back to the other view, Heidi, and just show um, the final sketches if people did a second one of the moth, it would be fun to see those too. Yeah, definitely. So if anybody's drew the moth and wants to turn their camera on and share their sketch. Great. Nice, Carol, you made a long way. All right. Great. Yeah. Oh, Laura, nice lettering. All right, I got to go back to my gallery view. Oh, Anetta, that's gorgeous. Wow. See, I mean, isn't it interesting? Like, oh, that's really nice. Beautiful. I love that. Oh, so while you're sharing this, I want to tell you that. Um, so it, after I after I wrote this book, um, it's been really fun to see like where it's gone and and who's used it. And um, I love seeing the work that kids do. So I started a, a part of my website. It's a Explorers Gallery and it's for kids artwork. So if you have something you want to share, I would love you to send me a photo of it in my Contact information is in the chat at the very top. And also, I think Heidi will send it out to you. We'll send you some information about um, how you can share your artwork. And it's very simple. I, I'd love you to just, um, you just put your name and your age and where you're from, like just the state. And I'll add to the, to the gallery. So I'd love to see some more moths come in there or other things or shells or or other um, things that you find around your own house. Uh, that would be great. Love to share some additional artwork. Yeah, that's great. Thanks. Um, you know, so yes, as Jean said, we will be following up probably on Monday with an email that has a link to this, the video from this, as well as uh, where you can buy Jean's book and um, where you can find out more about the Columbia Land Conservancy. And if you uh, want to come to our next nature night, it's on March 18th. And it's about amphibian migration and road crossing in the Hudson Valley. And we'll be talking about uh, some of these spring migrating frogs and salamanders and how you can help them cross the road. And, oh, and if I had known that, Heidi, I'd have shown my salamander sketches from uh, years of doing cross road crossings and... Uh... <laughs> I should have, I should, you, well, you can come to the next I'm nature come night. next week because I want to do it here. That's awesome. <laughs> and, and, yeah, and so um, that you can find out more information about that at our website, which is clctrust.org. And, uh, you know, I just want to thank Jean so much for sharing, you know, your your passion and your your skills with us. And I'm, I'm looking forward to watching this replay and, and sketching along with you since... I, I wanted to I wanted to watch and and make sure we kept an eye on everything. So uh, you know I appreciate your your time and your passion for this, and we look forward to you know working with you in the future. So if there's any other questions, we've got oh we're actually a little bit we're one minute over, but if there's yep. any last questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Um, I really appreciate the work that you do at the. Land Conservancy, I appreciate being able to use your preserves and enjoy them, uh, especially now. So, um, so thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. And, and um, thanks to all of you for being good sports and drawing along for a little bit tonight. Um, it'd be great to draw in person someday. Yeah, hopefully we'll, we'll get back to that. And <laughs> some point. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll, and I will send Jean's contact information in a follow-up email. So, all right, well, thank you everyone and have a good evening and get out and draw some things. All right.